Welcome back to SparkCon 2020. We're super excited about these uh, topics and these sessions we're holding to this week, this entire week, from the 5th to the 9th. We have multiple sessions. We had Mark LaCour open it up with the keynote and talking about the future of oil and gas. And, and we also have, uh, we just got off this morning with uh, Dr. Joel Warnicke and talking about, you know, confined uh spaces and, and some of the things that are talking about reducing your risk and integrity of your un underground storage systems. And there's, you know, the, the holistic approach about that. And if you didn't have an opportunity to catch it live, make sure that you catch up and, and share that information and uh, check it out and make sure that you have that information to share with your team and your organization. And also uh, we had David Lewis who, who, we reviewed environmental management in challenging times. And as you know, 2020 hasn't been exactly the, the, uh, the banner year for a lot of individuals. And I want to just also remind everybody that these sessions are brought to you by experts in their field. They're aware and, you know, uh, working hard to bring this information to you and taking their time and their dedication to, to bring information that, They've, they've researched and studied. Now, with anything, we want to make sure that you understand that all of these subjects are brought to you by their research and their information. And by no means, and stretch of the imagination, uh, mandates that this is what you have to do and, and this is what is required. However, it's valuable information and you need to do your own research, do your own analysis and make sure that you understand what needs to fit into your organization. So we're just making sure that you, we, we bring this information to you, bring it to the table, and allow you to get a little bit of clarity on what other people are doing in the industry and opening up to the, the dialogue of, let's start the conversation. Let's make sure that we're understanding what it is. And as Mark LaCour opened up in the keynote, it's let's make sure that we educate the community that we're working in about the value we're bringing to the table, that we're bringing to the world. Because as an industry, there's a lot of technology, a lot of innovation taking place, and a lot of things that are going to be happening in the future. And it's at times challenging, and with any challenge brings opportunities. And so what we want to do is continue to bring opportunities for the rest of the week. We're going to be talking about change and digital adoption on I, uh, on Friday, 10-9, with Jeffrey Can on, um, on the digital adoption and some of the technologies that are taking place. Also, we're going to be talking to Glenn on Thursday, uh, uh, HDD risk management. Uh, and then also we're going to be talking on uh, Scott Gailey on improving construction and services agreements, because that's always important. He's going to be talking from uh, 2 p.m. to 3 p.m. Central Time. And then uh, also we had Batsel Shah yesterday on Tuesday talking about improved ground investigations for pipeline and linear construction. It was an amazing presentation. And if you're not familiar with uh, Dr. Shah, check out that, that session and make sure that you have an opportunity to put this in perspective and how it how it needs to be uh, used in your organization. So today's talk and this afternoon's talk is is by um, by Adam Hartung, and Adam is kind of outlining some of the things that we need to prepare for 2022 and beyond, and some of the important trends and their impacts, and and some of the things that he's talking about are considerations you know he's done a lot of research he's been in the industry for a very long time 
And I think it's important for us to understand that there are considerations and challenges. And like I said, there's always an opportunity in every challenge. And we just have to discover what that looks like and what that means to the industry and specifically our organization in particular. You know, we're all doing different things at different times. We have people retiring. We have promotions happening internally. And all this knowledge management and this knowledge transfer needs to be fairly seamless. And I think every organization is in a position that they can actually use information in a u uh, unique and powerful way going forward. And I think that there's a lot of expertise in this session, this platform, and some of the things we're talking about this week. Uh, Spark Thought has done a tremendous job at bringing some of these items to the table, delivering this information. And as we transfer this knowledge from the sessions to you, there's this conversation that needs to start and take place. So if you're looking to understand and appreciate some more uh, about these topics, reach out to the contacts that are in the sessions, reach out to the contacts at Spark Thought. And as always, SparkCon 2020 is here to serve and deliver the best possible and most recent updated information for your, your future. And I just want to make sure that we all understand that there, and appreciate the fact that we're in this together. You know, we're on the same planet, spinning through the universe. And there are a lot of things that um, are available to you as an organization. Uh, so make sure that you have an opportunity to reach out to Spark Thought if you need uh, contacts for any of the individuals on the, on the sessions and you want to be able to realize some of your goals in your organization. And so it's important for us to understand. Now, Adam, because of travel and some of the uh, requirements and challenges in his schedule, we had to record this in in, uh, in the past. And so we'll go through this as he talks about his perspective and his understanding of what's taking place. So thank you so much for being at SparkCon 2020. Thank you for joining this session and others along this week. And make sure that you're reaching out, making those connections and those contacts and starting a conversation. So without a further ado, let's make sure that we understand what Adam brings to the table. And thank you so much again for being here. Look forward to you on the con on the after this presentation. Hey, next we have Adam Hartung up, and he's a futurist and someone that's been setting trends and analysis in the industry for years with over 400 Forbes articles published and over 20 years experience in setting trends, understanding trends and setting future projections. And some of the things that are going on in the in the environment, in the community now, we want to talk about what is taking place today in the industry. Adam has been with with uh, Spark Partners for a number of years and has a training session called Think Like an Innovator. Thank you, Adam, for being here and thank you for your the opportunity to uh, talk about future trends in the industry. And I just wanna ask you one quick question to get the party started is why trends and why is it important for us to understand the trends right now today? You bet, Russ. Thanks for that great intro. Uh, you know, we live in a fast changing world. Everybody says that. I just screwed up. Yeah, that's okay. <laughs> we live in a fast changing world and we all uh, say that, but we don't think about what the implications are. In business, we've been trained actually to do most of our business planning by looking in the rearview mirror. If you think about it, you pick up information that you gleaned from consumption last year. You, you know, what did your consumers, your, your customers do last year? Uh, you know, what did your business do last year? Who did you sell to? How much did you sell? All of this is historical data. And unfortunately, there's no 
guarantee that the future is going to look anything like the past. You know, they say that with all the financial recommendations they make all the time on investments. But it's true in everything we do. We really need to plan for the future, not plan from the past. When we live in a world that's changing as fast as one that we are in today. So why are we so ineffective and inefficient at predicting the future these days? Because what we try to do is plan for the future from the past. We try to think of the future or, or the time continuum as being linear. You know, if, if demand for a product like, say, oil or gasoline or, uh, you know, some plastic products was growing at, say, 3 or 4 or 6 percent a year, we like to think it would continue to move at that pace, maybe plus or minus 10 or 15 percent. We tend to think of things as being linear. And so we try to project off of a linear past. But what we know is that that's in fact not the way the world works. You know, I had the great luck that I spent several years working with Clayton Christensen who from Harvard Business School who wrote The Innovator's Dilemma, okay? And in that, he put forward that there's sustaining innovations and disruptive innovations. And he talked about how sustaining innovations are linear, but disruptive innovations, they happen in big chunks. Well, that's what we're seeing happen in terms of change and disturbance is that whenever something happens, it generally happens in a big way, you know? So what we get is a, a fairly consistent performance improvement that's going along at a very measurable engineering kind of a pace. But then there's a big change in the environment and that big change causes a step change in terms of how people have to react to it. Give you just a simple example. Um, we'd spent 30 years building out the retail sector in which we, uh, you know, uh, for, for the VHS tapes, okay? So we had entertainment, went to the movies. Now we could get VHS tapes, which later became DVDs. And it took us 30 years for everybody to buy a machine, for Blockbuster to get entrenched, all that good stuff to happen. Then there's some other people completely doing nothing in entertainment that are working on, on bandwidth. And they're trying to say, how do I push more bandwidth in the telecom industry down a pipe? You know, and as they right. keep people from copper to fiber, they go to broadband, they finally get to the point where they can push a whole lot of content down the pipe. And this introduction of broadband means that we can now start to stream movies. So rather than having to go somewhere, we could stream the movie directly into our home or into our office or where we wanted to be. In 16 months, the entire infrastructure around VHS tapes and DVDs became obsolete. Yeah. I mean, why? Uh, in fact, Russ, if you've got a VHS tape in your house, I give you permission to throw it away. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, fortunately, I took all of my uh, digital media that was on tape and converted it to a digital format. So hopefully it'll last a little longer than the tape. You know, it's interesting. And so now a lot of people are online, they're using digital, they're using the internet, and they're, they're experiencing this shift in the market because of a pandemic. And so that has to impact the future and the trending that is taking place in the market and the industry. And I have to, you know, my experience is that we're accelerating that. And so is that some of the experience that you've had uh, in the in the predictions that you're working on? Yeah, so we have these big major shifts. So trends are happening. Uh, there's major trends, macro trends, and then there's you know industry trends, and then there's company trends and product trends. So we can watch uh, the impact of trends in big ways. The macro trends, though, are things like COVID-19. It affects everybody, right, and how we right. behave. Now, here's why it feels like we've accelerated the trend, and that's because Let's say that you, uh, let's talk about electronic commerce, for example. Uh, there were some early adopters of electronic commerce 15 years ago. And over time, it becomes sort of mainstream. You know, most people get an Amazon account. Most people get an Amazon Prime account, right? We see that it becomes very mainstream. But the reality is that you still have laggards, okay? There are still people that don't sign up. They don't use electronic commerce. They still go to the retail store. So we have a body of early adopters. They're heavily using this. We have a mainstreamers who are still using it. Uh, using maybe a bit more of it, but, you know, it's become mainstream, maybe using it every week or two. Now what happens is you get one of these mega disruptions, okay, like COVID. And what occurs is that all the mainstream people dramatically accelerate their use of electronic commerce, okay, because they say, well, those retail stores are closed. There's so many retail stores closed that don't have any choice but to use electronic commerce. But then we also reach into the laggard community, the people who said, you know, I, I was happy going to the store. I never got an account. I don't shop online. I don't want to give up my credit card. They're laggards on that trend. And they suddenly have no choice but to catch up to the trend. So they, boom, it's like a it's like a slingshot effect, right? All of a sudden, that, that cord was pulled way back and it was sitting back there and 
Now all these mainstreamers are doing twice as much and all the laggards suddenly jump into the market. And so it has that real strong feeling of acceleration. It's so, really uh, amazing to me to even the fact that we have this virtual event right now and the fact that we're, you know, not going to uh, a conference live and in person and talking to people and shifting and, you know, exchanging cards. And I, I feel for some of the people that are struggling and overwhelmed with some of the technology that's taken place. And so the laggards are really having to get caught up and, and start utilizing the technology, even if they don't want to kick it and screaming. So, right. so how does that impact the overall industry and, and some of the things that are taking place in, the, in, in today's uh, retail space? Like, um, you know, some of the buying and purchasing and, and transactions that are taking place. Sure. Well, let's do those two sort of uh, in, in sequence. First, let's talk about the people that are running the SparkCon conference, SparkDot people, Amon, and, and the team. You know, yeah. really got to hand it to them for putting this conference together and realizing this is the way we're going to do it in the future. I started working 15 years ago with associations because associations had to deal with the emergence of LinkedIn and Facebook and a lot of things that we look to associations to do, like recruiting, uh, a lot of those sorts of activities were suddenly getting shifted to these other online environments. So what's gonna keep, keep them relevant? And one of the things that associations often thought they did was they put on events. But what we've seen happen over 15 years is fewer and fewer companies are willing to send a lot of people to an event, right? If you think about it, it just ever since before the Great Recession, but certainly hit us in the Great Recession and afterward, you know, the boss is saying, do you really need to get on a plane and fly to Phoenix to go to that conference? I and mean, what are you going to get out of it? You know, by the time I buy the plane ticket, by the time you've gone to today's hotel, meals, and then, I, you know, i got to backfill you on your job. And so there was there was this, this uh, drag, you know, there was like a, an anchor pulling on these things that was getting hard harder and harder and harder for people to put on conferences. But yet, a lot of associations thought that's what they needed to do. Now we have the pandemic. Now people have said, well, I don't want my association to die. And people that market and, and want to get interactions in the industry, companies like Spark thought, well, okay, what are we going to do? Well, let's keep this interaction going. Let's keep people talking. Let's think about what did we really do? We connected people. We helped people exchange ideas. We wanted to introduce innovation into the business model. And so what do we do? We start having these virtual conferences. These will not go away. Now They're not going to go away. No. Now that we've learned how to do them, they're beautiful because now I can, I can say, hey, I can go, I can work for four or five hours, and then I can go to this conference in my office or in my home office, uh, you know, for, for three or four hours. Now I can also decide, I can look at the agenda just like I used to. I would decide, oh, I, you know, these are the sessions I most want to see. I can work that into my work day. So what will happen is people will go to more conferences than they did in the past because they're more available and they're more usable and they can access them. They can access them asynchronously. In the old days, what did we have to do? We had to fly somewhere, get to be in the room at that time when it happened. But what we know is that as many people are going to enjoy watching us right now, there's a whole bunch more people going to enjoy looking at this conference and looking at our interview down the road. You know, this will be archived, it'll be available, and people will come along in, in a week, two weeks, three weeks, three months, and they'll look at this again and they'll get value out of it again. So this this need to be in a world in which we are mobile and we're asynchronous means that this technology we're using now is, is going to continue. So there will be fewer in live conferences and there will be more of these kinds of things. Now we have to think about what, what are the ripple effects of that? Well, okay, I live in Las Vegas, Nevada. We do a tremendous number of conferences in Las Vegas. Yeah. We have all these hotel rooms. What's gonna happen? <laughs> There's just gonna be fewer conferences. There's gonna be fewer people coming to conferences. So the city of Las Vegas is gonna to have to start thinking up additional ways. It's gonna to have to innovate how it's gonna fill those hotel rooms, right? It's not gonna be able to just rely on the conferences coming back. And the ones that do come back for physical are gonna be smaller. They're gonna be more focused. So that you're gonna to have to adapt, you're gonna to have to adjust. And it's those ripple effects that people often miss. Uh, like you said, the, we're talking about electronic commerce. What happens in the field of retail? Okay, we shift more to electronic commerce. That means some retailers don't survive. And we've been seeing that, right? The list, yeah, of people, yeah they're going bankrupt. The number of stores that say, we're not going bankrupt, but we're show, shutting four or 500 stores. What's gonna happen? Well, within four years, we're gonna see 50% of all the retail real estate go empty. So now what's gonna to happen to that real estate? What's it gonna to convert to? We need innovation. 
Somebody's going to have to start saying, hey, here's all these empty stores. Here's these empty shopping malls, complete strip malls that are completely empty, uh, walk-in malls that are going to be closed. They're going to be empty. What? So we're going to need innovation, right, around that. In the meantime, yeah. now all those retail jobs are gone. So people are going to have to start to think about what am I going to do? What, what kind of jobs are going to be available in the post-COVID world? You know, how am I going to make, make a living? And so you're going to have to train. You're going to have to think about what the new jobs are going to be. The, if the value of the real estate falls because it's slow for the innovation to take over the real estate, we're going to have a property tax problem. Nobody's going to pay, you know, empty buildings don't pay the real estate taxes that, that usable buildings do, right? So now the real estate taxes fall. If real estate taxes fall, why do we fund the schools, right? It's because that's where we probably get that. Now, simultaneously, we got people doing schooling at home. If the, if the, if the tax receipts go down, we don't have as much money to fund schools. We've had to shut some schools down in order to consolidate to make the hybrid model work. Then are we ever going to go back to a full end-time school? Probably not. So this is the value of looking at the trends. You start with that mega trend, COVID, and we start working it down. How is that going to impact conferences? How is it going to impact shopping? How is that going to impact retail taxes? And then you start seeing how these things cluster, and you start saying, wow, my scenario of the year 2025 and year 2030 is going to be a lot different than what I thought, may have thought in 2015 because these things are clustering together. We're seeing the big trends happen. We're seeing them ripple out and it's going to impact, it's going to impact everybody. It's, you know, back when the internet came along around the turn of the century, there were people who would, uh, you know, say, well, is the internet really going to be a big deal? And, and I, you know, myself and other people were saying, hey, it's like fire. It's like the wheel. Once you have it, it's applicable yeah. in so many places. Well, this is, this COVID-19 is opening up a lot of doors, not, not, like the internet innovation was, but it, in the sense, it's pushing people to use these innovations in new and creative ways. You know, new companies that, you know, things like Skype weren't necessarily considered all that relevant. Microsoft bought it. I'm not sure they're putting a lot of marketing into it. Now all of a sudden Skype is something we want to use more of. Uh, you know, a company like Zoom, growing along a little bit, explodes, right? But those, right. those are just the first technologies. Remember, this is going to keep accelerating. People are going to improve on it. People are going to get better at it. And we're going to keep seeing this change happen. And so what we're seeing now is people are, are going to be mobile more than they ever were, but they're going to be mobile this way. When, when you yeah. and I were young, Russ, we couldn't wait to get those car keys. Man, you know, that was big. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Get that car key. Why? Because it, it was the keys to the world. Now, like, mobility. Yeah, absolutely. For the modern people today, this is the key to the world, right? Why? Yeah. I, if I don't have to take my atoms to somewhere, I can instead just take my bits through this kind of technology, then I'm going to do more of that. Why? Because I'm more productive. Yeah. Okay. And I don't want to waste the time. I don't want the downtime of moving my atoms around. That doesn't mean that it's going to go away. I'm still going to want to go on holidays. I'm still going to want to go downtown Las Vegas and do some gambling and watch a show. It's still going to happen, but yeah. things are going to be different. I'm going to be more interested in some other ways that I can asynchronously come into this environment, asynchronously take advantage of mobility in ways that I haven't done it before. And so that's going to ripple down through all of the industries, and and everybody has to think about what are those implications. You know, well, it sounds like no. it sounds like Adam that we really need to think about the innovation of whatever industry industry we happen to be in, and have the opportunity to actually think about how we can innovate, not if we need to, because right. it's it's really going to impact everybody across the board. Is that, is that accurate? Is that a, a fair assessment? Very much so. And, and what we're seeing is this uh, movement. So let's think about, for example, what I said about bandwidth. When bandwidth first starts coming about, the, the, you have the telecom companies are, are giving us this capability. And then that was augmented by the cable companies like, like Comcast, right? But what right. we had at first was a focus on the actual infrastructure itself, right? How do I get the bandwidth? How much bandwidth? So there was innovation around improving the bandwidth, improving the speed, improving the what we now call a commodity. Now bandwidth is a commodity, right? I, yeah. I can remember when you paid a lot of money to have a high-speed internet connection. Now everybody has one pretty much, and it doesn't really cost anything at all. It's part of your service that you buy. So what we see now is the innovation starts happening in the applications. And so what the the the, the 
the more you want to invest your dollars, where you want to invest your time, moves towards those applications. You want to say, well, who's taking advantage of that? Who's taking advantage of those trends? And so, you know, for example, in our industry, the oil and gas industry, what we're going to see is innovations around extraction have been happening for a long time. And those are great innovations, and we're going to continue to see innovations in extraction. But what, but what's going to continue to happen now is more focus on the innovation of use, right? So, mm -hmm. you know, I, again. In my age, I can remember when all we thought about with oil and gas was either you put it in your car, or you put it in your home heating, or you put it into an, an electric utility generator, right? That was right. All, oh, God. That's not the business anymore. Now think about all these single-use plastics. Think about all the uses of petrochemicals out there. That's mm -hmm. really where the industry's taken off. That, you know, and, and we even saw last, you know, recently last week we saw, you know, a couple of weeks ago, we saw ConocoPhillips come out with a, with a, with a, uh, a statement that it was supporting a carbon use tax. So we're seeing the people that are in the extraction business, some of them are stepping up and saying, hey, we're okay with that for a whole bunch of trend reasons related to the ecology and that kind of stuff. But they're not saying they're walking away from the petrochemical industry. Oh, heck no. Yeah, it's the same thing, a different look at it, right? And we're going to innovate in different places. We're going to start moving more towards how the products are used with our innovation. And that's going to cause everybody in the industry to have to start to make that shift along with it, I think. Well, anytime you have a large market like the oil and gas industry, there's there's going to be uh, shifts in the in the way that utilization is taking place, in the way that the market is moving toward, and it, and a lot of times right now, uh, I've seen a lot of efficiencies being uh, you know used utilized in in how data is being you know gathered and captured and making sure that what we're doing right now at this moment is very effective and efficient with our with our use of our resources and i know that that's it's one of the areas that will continue to grow uh, as these large industries uh you know evolve and, and data is important and the trend in gathering data is is also growing and i see that more and more uh where you're gathering uh data from you know how much utilization what what uh, what is being used and how how we can get the most out of what we're have, having to produce, right? And so, how does that how does that impact uh, some of the areas of of what we're doing right now? Okay, so what happened was you know we had this agrarian economy back in the in seventeen eighteen hundreds that moved into the industrial era, right? And right. so. The industrial era, machinery, all those kinds of things become important. Commodities, we're going to make iron, going to make steel, move down that road. So around the turn of the century, a little bit before, we shifted into this new thing we're calling the, the knowledge era, right? It's the, the knowledge economy. And what we're seeing today is oftentimes the data about something can be worth more than the something itself. Uh, kind of an example of this is Amazon. What they know about your shopping patterns is more profitable than the money they can make off delivering you the packages, right? So, so data, as you said, becomes important. And that's true in all industries today. So what we have to take a look at is, is no matter where you're touching the information in the industry, whether it's at the point of, 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 of seeking to find something, if it's in the extraction process, if it's in the distribution process, if it's in the transformation process, what we might call refining and those kinds of processes of altering the chemical compounds from A to B, and then moving that into a final product and the use of the final product, the life of the final product, the care of the final product, then the elimination of the final product. Is it waste? Is it trash? Is it recyclable? How could it be reused? There's data through that whole process, right? All kinds of data. So what we know today is that the people that are very smart about thinking about, well, how is this happening, right? And where can I collect the data are finding that in addition to selling the product, they can sell the data. And and, and can be like, you know, kind of like, I'll sell you, the, if you buy the product for me, I give you access to the data. I'm going to make yeah. you I want to make you better. I want to make you able to do your job in a way that you're going to be more profitable. So that you start, in a way, thinking differently about how you make your profits. Instead of saying, well, I make the profit on the product, say, well, if you buy my product, I give you this other thing. And this other thing is really, really valuable, right? Yeah. And so if you want access to this data, let me help you. Let me help you make more money. You know, when you're helping your customer make more money, you make more money. It's a pretty simple equation. <laughs> yeah, it's a very simple equation. You know, and it's it's interesting because I think the uh, I think it's accelerating. You know, years ago, you know, it's, it's like when we were growing up, 
things didn't seem like they were moving so quickly. And then, like you said, the turn of the century when the internet came on board, you know, I've been on email since 95 and it just seems like it's accelerating. And now some of the trends in the industry are, are analysis, you know, analytics and uh, looking at data in a different way and, and slicing that information up. And it's really incredibly valuable when we can understand what is taking place in real time and the internet and the access to data and and uh, allowing us to get information in real time is making a huge impact. And what do you see kind of looking forward in the future with you know, some of the things that are going with AR and AI and, and some of the uh, technologies that are evolving right now? Uh, where do you see that taking us? Again, let's, let's talk about a little bit about the speed issue. Um, it, it is in, in our world, we tend to think of this as, as accelerating. But what we know now, those of us that kind of like live in this innovation world and looking at change and how change happens, it's, it's actually been true for a long time. Could, yeah. You can imagine this. It's not hard to imagine. It's 1915, 1916, that sort of a time. And almost everybody's getting around with a horse or a horse and a buggy. Right. And automobiles are just coming onto the scene and people are sort of like, yeah, well, really, I mean, you got to put gasoline in it. It doesn't work. It'll never time. work. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's much easier to take care of my horse than it is to deal. And by the way, we don't have a lot of roads. And so since we don't have a lot of roads, it's hard to get the car. I want to go. So in 1915, it can look like, hey, I'm not sure what's going to happen here. By 1925, the horses are gone. Right. Actually, by 1922, the horses are gone. And I'm starting to say that having horses in major cities is a big problem because they leave manure everywhere. We don't like it. They tear up the dirt roads and blah, blah, blah. So we did that. That change happened really fast. We went from horses to cars actually pretty quick. So but the reality is you and I weren't there. We didn't see it. We didn't feel it. And so what happens is we didn't catch it. So these long waves, a guy named Kondratiev out of Russia studied on them, and then a guy named Champetier, who's also Russian, moved to the United States, has written a lot about these, how these long waves happen. Where you have this, this, this period of stability, a big event, and then you go to the next period. And so where we are today is think about automobiles. We go back to you and I couldn't wait to get our hands on the keys, right? Right. Well, Go talk to young people today about how excited they are to get their hands on the keys. I, I mean, I get surprised. I frequently run into people 18, 19 years old that don't have a driver's license. And I kind of have to stop and think about that. And I'm like, why? But then I start thinking about the world they live in. And, and they know they're going to have autonomous cars. That, yeah, I mean, they're expecting it. Yeah. They live in a lift world today, right? Yeah. Say, okay. I'm sitting here running the arithmetic in my head, buying a vehicle, charging, paying for all this stuff. And just, you know. <laughs> It's just a lot easier for me to use. If you do the math, it works, right? Yeah, it really does. And especially if you're in a semi-urban or urban environment. Mm -hmm. I have a son that just finished uh, his PhD in, uh, at the University of Chicago. And when he was, you know, and I had given him a car when he started college 10 years ago. Uh -huh. And increasingly as each year went by, I was noticing that he just had less and less value for this vehicle. And it got to the point that he said, Dad, I, I parked that car way out in the suburbs. And I go get it when I absolutely have to use it because it's so much cheaper and easier for me to get around Chicago using Uber and Lyft. And when I talk to him about, so, you know, what's the next generation? He's kind of like, well, you know, he can't wait for those drivers to go away. He's like, you know, okay, to him, an autonomous car is just an automatic thing. It's going to happen. So what do we see happening here? People getting less interested in buying cars. I'm of the generation where the more cars you had, the merrier. So you would get six of them in the driveway. Yeah. It's not going to be like that. To the extent we have cars are going to be autonomous, people don't necessarily want to own those cars. They might be in a fleet environment where they're going around, and they want them to be smart. They want to, they want to be in a situation where they say, you know what? I wish somebody knew that every Monday at 9 o'clock I want to go grocery shopping, and this car just showed up, right? Yeah. They're looking for that intelligence to get built in because they already have it today. There's so much intelligence in their interface to the world through the Internet, so many applications that they use on their phones again, you know, the apps they use, the applications that they have on their, on their uh, tablets are smart. They know who they are. They know where they were before. They know where they want to go. And they're saying, that, I want that to get mimicked in my real world. So I want the, the autonomous vehicles to be smart, to know that I'm going to need rides for these things, to know who I am by reading the code as I step into the vehicle and they know where my home is. I don't have to tell the car where my home is. This stuff could all be automated. And they're saying it will be automated. 
We have no doubt that it will, it be, will be. Yes. And so that's the direction they're headed. So we have to back up and start saying, how do we feed that? How do we make their lives mm -hmm. easier? What is the technology that we can add to this situation to make it more successful? So how could we make mass transit more successful? Instead of having to have an autonomous car pick me up, what kind of data do I know about mass transit and the use of trains and the use of, of, of uh, uh, buses and, you know, taxi cabs and the Ubers? How, how can I get data around that sort of stuff? And, and what is, so now, and we both keep pulling this back. So what does this tell me about my needs, my demands? So where are the commodities going to be needed the most, right? Where have I got high levels of commodity consumption per person? We're probably going to see commodity levels per person change. You know, we had a high, very high level of consumption of oil per person in the United States. That's on the now I'm going to trend downward, most likely. I'm going to trend up. We're going to start trending downward. But that's the United States. What's mm -hmm. going to happen in other countries that are less developed? You know, what's going to happen in Brazil? A lot of people in Brazil, very different kind of a country. Yeah. Mexico, you know, what's going to happen in Africa? What's going to happen, you know, in Europe? So we have to move away. It's kind of like there's no such thing as a commodity. You like to think it's a commodity, but it all depends on where it is. I like to use the example that if I go uh, down here on a hot day and I'm walking along the Las Vegas Strip and I want a Coke, it's going to cost me three dollars and a half from one of those little shops that I want to buy it from. Yeah. I could get to the grocery store. I could buy a twelve pack for three bucks and a half, right? So it's a commodity in that it's a Coke or a Pepsi in a can, but it's not a commodity in that. If the person who's smart enough to be where I want it, when I want it, can charge me what they want. So that's where we see everything headed, is that stop thinking of a commodity as a generic, you know, just one price, everything fits all, but rather, where would it be more valuable and how would it be more valuable? There, there are countries that are going to have to accelerate through an, a piece of an industrial era, like India. India. India never got fully through the industrial era, right? So yeah. while a lot of people are trying to reduce their carbon emissions, all things, you know, in India, if you start reducing carbon emissions, you kill people. There's no jobs. There's nothing for them to eat, right? Yeah. So they have to have a different economy. They approach the problem differently. The Chinese approach the problem differently. The Japanese approach the problem differently because of high concentration, density, population, etc. So what we have to do now is start realizing that, yes, there's value in data and we sell it. And there's value in us studying that data to figure out how we want to grow our business, right? If I have the product uh, in, 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 every, in the same place everybody else has and there's not any differentiation, I'm not going to make much money. So I have to start thinking about where do I want to be and how do I differentiate, right? How can I differentiate my commodity and how can I differentiate it by adding value to it, which is where we were before, you know, moving from just extracting the raw product up through the, the processing of the product to intermediate and final stages, moving it into used products, you know, like plastic bags or whatever, and then on down that road, all the way down to then how do I get it back? So there'll be whole, there are whole industries emerging now about what do I do with this product as it reaches end of life, right? We focus now on end of life. 30 years ago, it was kind of a problem. It was kind of an issue. Today, it's everybody. They go, what do I do? You know, once the stomach comes out of the tailpipe, what am I going to do with it? Once, once I'm finished using this product, you know, what am I going to do with it? So these are, this is where we have to start to innovate. This is where we can take our thinking in the industry so we help solve the problem from sort of cradle to grave. And this, that, the cradle to grave business is going to grow. It's absolutely going to grow. I mean, as long as the population grows, it's going to grow, right? There's going to be alternatives. There's going to be substitute products. But these things will fit together, and they're going to create tremendous opportunities for the people that really get in there and study what's happening with the users, what's happening with these trends, and then start predicting them in ways that they can say, hey, I now see an opening where I can go be more successful. Well, it's, 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 and it goes back to the innovation. And it goes back to the idea that uh, we have an opportunity to take what we were using as a commodity, use it just in time, and then and then service and add value to that product or service. Right, right. I mean, when, often when we think as business people, when we think we're done with a product, we forget that somebody else is just starting with it. So what kind of opportunity does that present as I think about that next step? If they're starting with that product, where are they going? You know, how effective are they? How efficient are they? Um, now, as I said, you might want to support them, help them make more money. But think about kind of the Amazon way of thinking. Amazon says, you know, people are getting a little tired of carrying books around. 
Uh, you know, they, there were a lot of people who don't want to admit this, but, you know, paper books were becoming less popular. But the publishers didn't want to get involved in digital publishing. So finally, Amazon said, OK, you know, we're going to do it. We're going to put out an e-reader and we're going to build a platform that, with the Kindle software. We're going to do it. And now they're the world's largest publisher by at least an order of magnitude, if not two orders of magnitude. So that's where some big opportunities can hit. If you're selling something and your customer, look at the opportunity that you're that that next step in the pipeline has. And it, could you do something with that next step? Could you maybe make more out of it than the person who's there today? And if so, that's that's an opportunity. So you have to invent upward. That's why I think we're pushing a lot on here and saying that in the modern era, it's about understanding data, understanding use, understanding needs, understanding value that you can deliver, and then using that to keep projecting upward to capture more value. You know, I want to shift gears a little bit here, Adam, and talk about how innovation and some of this information coming through is is impacting the the knowledge worker and the education system. And, you know, COVID and the pandemic, you know, we're, we're learning. And, and if, information, there's no shortage of information. I think it's a shortage of organized information. And, you know, there may be some people here in the trades that are watching this and, and working to understand where do I place my time and effort and energy in learning about some of the things that are emerging in the market and how can I stay on top of the education process and how can I continue to learn and grow and evolve in, in the market. So, so what are your experiences uh, around that subject and, and how can we prepare for that? Right. Well, I think that it's a, we live in a wonderful era and I think it's wonderful for everybody, including people that are over 50 and over 60 and even over 70. So how do I just, how can I say that? Well, again, you keep hearing me refer back to these historical references. Yeah. When I was a little boy, they taught us a song about John Henry. John Henry was a guy who went out and he worked for the railroad and he drove spikes into building the railroads, right? And yeah. the song details a story about how somebody invents a machine that can drive spikes. John Henry has, is forced to compete with the machine. He goes out one day and he drives spikes and he dies. He drives so spikes, he kills himself trying to drive spikes to keep up with the machine. The, the story of John Henry, this is a song from the 1930s, right? The story there was that as, as, as automation and innovation moves forward, what happens is, is that some of the old things are no longer valuable and you have to move forward. Now, the problem with the industrial era was that I couldn't, you know, like when the machine came, I now have to go work in a factory, right? I, there's not much I, one of the problems with the industrial era was an individual couldn't do a lot. It was a collective. You had to go to a company. You had to make things, right? You had to be in these facilities. You had to, you know, it was very important to show up on the time, to work your shift, to get it done, you know, hand over to the next shift. These were really important issues. That's not true anymore. We now live in this wonderfully asynchronous world where we're mobile by virtue of these kinds of devices and where the devices we have and the networks we live on are smart. There's artificial intelligence everywhere. And, and what does that mean? It means that we're all part of, potentially part of this thing they call the gig economy. Now yeah. today, you don't have to be working in a company anymore. You don't have to all the collective be together. We can start to say, what's my value? What, what am I doing to give value to the company, give value to, to the customer? And you think about, can I capture some of that value myself? Should I operate independently? Or should I work in a gig economy, you know, sort of like these people that work for, uh, work for Uber? You know, they're working in the gig economy. Saying, hey, I can capture some of this value of people by sharing my car, driving for them, that kind of thing. And that's something you couldn't do 20 years ago. Just 20 years ago, we still, you know, I, I worked in a consulting firm for a long time. We, we went to offices, right? We got up yeah. got on the train, went to the office. We went to the client site. We sat in the client site. We had, had to pay for hotel rooms, plane tickets, to go spend three days in the conference room, interacting with each other, hashing out ideas. Now I have this technology, right? And I can do this at home. So when you say education, I'm a big thing. You don't have to go out there and be an electrical engineer or a computer engineer. You don't have to be somebody that can work at Google or work at, at Apple. But you could be somebody that knows how to use this technology. Yeah. And it, it's not hard to use. And it's really smart technology. And all you have to think about is how can I apply it? How can I apply it to help my community? And how can I apply it to help my family? How, and you start there. How could we use this in our own little world and then start thinking about how that gets bigger, how you can expand it out and how you can start adding value to more people? I mean, I think we live in a world today. It's uh, 
Many years ago, there was a television series called Max Headroom based on some movies out of England. And there was this guy who lived in the TV and he'd fly all around the network of the TV and talk to people. Yeah. It's true today. We live in that world. It's called the Internet. We fly around with these cameras and our microphones and we can talk to each other and we can do it anytime we want. And if I can't connect with you now, no problem. I'll leave you a message. Pick it up when you want. Right. You know, it's yeah. a it's so it's a wonderful time because you don't have to retire. You don't have to say I'm I'm 50 and I'm and I'm 60 and there's and I got to move out so somebody can come in and, and do my eight to five. Now you can say, hey, you know, I can go do these things. I, I'm capable. I can sit down at a laptop or I can sit down at a at a at a, a, a tablet. And I can I can make things happen. You know, I can interact. I can help people cook. I can help people learn how to uh, solve problems with their families. I can help people with their spiritual life. There's so many things that you can do with this technology where you can help people add value and be successful. So I just think it's it's a wonderful time to be alive and, and, and think about all the things that you can do to help people close to you or people far, far away. And just think of the positive outcome, the the opportunity to actually make an impact and a difference in somebody's life just by, you know, picking up a new skill or actually starting a new career. You know, during this pandemic, there's a lot of people that have opened up opportunities they never imagined because of the ability and the opportunity to learn new technology. And now you, you see it every day. At least I've, I've noticed it uh, more and more every time I turn around. And, and I think that's going to pick up. And you don't have to leave the organization to do that. You could be an entrepreneur where your organization supports the innovation and you continue to grow inside the organization as well. So it's, it's really an amazing time that we're living in. Our companies are today are becoming much more um, open internally. I mean, again, back years ago, there was an awful lot of this is your job, show up and do it. You know, you're a cog in a machine. That's yeah, not so much anymore, right? It, it's people are aware. They are, they're sitting there saying, wait a minute, you know, we've got to take this product and sell it. How can we sell it? What are the opportunities? And trying to get the collective of the people on in the company to think about what are our opportunities and where can we go? Which of our customers are likely to continue to be successful? Which are going to be laggards and be slow? We don't want to overinvest in the laggards. We want to try to find our way to move towards the ones that are doing the new, better things. And so, as we as we think about it, what are all these new applications that are coming along in the petrochemical world? How are we bringing things together? How are we helping people do things we couldn't do before? That's where we want to start thinking about where we innovate, where we put our energy, so we can continue to grow. Uh, we're a long way from running out of petrochemicals. It's going to be, you know, the commodity is going to be here for a very long time. It's just the productive use of it is going to change a bit. And so as that changes, we have to be innovative and adjust to those changes. So as we as we get close to wrapping up here, Adam, I, I know that it's important for us to understand some of the impacts in the industry and the big picture, the longer term uh, innovation, uh, you know, experiencing change, adapting to uh, the commodity versus the just in time and, you know, the value that you're adding to the community and, and uh, wherever you happen to be. What are some other things that are going to impact this going forward? Well, again, I think for right now, <laughs> it's important to realize that some of the things that have happened very recently are pretty far off the trends. So, we, you know, like anything, nothing moves in a straight line, right? There's a zigzag pattern. Yeah. So we have a big trend towards globalization. That That's going to continue. I mean, there's been some reduction in globalization in the last few years, um, but the overall forces are still pushing that direction. You, you can't undo the Internet. You can't undo free telecommunications. You can't undo all the things that are at our fingertips. And those are pushing us towards greater levels of globalization. So we've had some interference in the speed at which we're globalizing, but that will return. OK, uh, that there's no global. It's just going to happen. So globalization is really important. Um, we have to realize that there's an awful lot in the world that's just pure size related. And I, that gets back to demographics. Um, something as simple, very easy to predict what's going to happen with demographics in, in any location. You know, whether you want to use a city or a state or a country 
right? Or a hemisphere, whatever. Yeah. There's a lot of data and it's very, very, very predictable. So let's start saying, okay, where are the populations growing? Where are the populations not growing? Where are they aging? Where are they getting younger? And this affects demand, right? And so if we take a look, there's been some pretty serious changes in the demographics in the last 60 years. And that's affecting how we behave in our in these countries. So if we look at globalization and we look at demographics and we, we really take that big picture, it can help guide us as we start to get narrower around some of the other trends that we want to pay attention to. And, and then realizing that those big trends, that macro trends, globalization and, and demographics in particular, are, are they're going to now be coming out of a post-COVID world, right? And so in the post-COVID world, we're going to see different behaviors in different countries. Like I said, it's going to be different in Brazil than it's going to be in Mexico, than it's going to be in the United States. And that's going to be different from Canada. So just looking from north to south right here, we can see there are going to be vast differences in how people are going to behave and their demand profiles and their consumption profiles. I, I, I really want to thank you so much for sharing some of this information and also kind of giving us a slice of the future. You know, we've, we've been in, uh, we've been around for a few days here and there, and I'm still waiting for the Jetsons car, but, uh, you know, we'll, we'll wait for that a little bit longer. And I just, I just know that there's a lot of opportunity out there, even uh, as the pandemic evolves and, and go, takes us where, you know, where it's going to take us. I know that there's so many opportunities in the industry. I know there's so many options for us to grow and expand. And like you say, the globalization is on the horizon and some of the things that are taking place. And what we want to do is, you know, Spark Thought is, is putting this conference on together, SparkCon 2020. And we anticipate that we're going to continue to ask and answer questions and get some of the direction from people like yourself. Adam. Yep. So talk a little bit about what you're doing and, and how people can get a hold of you in the future before we start the Q&A. Sure. People can reach out to me at sparkpartners.com or my email, adam at sparkpartners.com. And, uh, you know, my focus is around helping people take a look at trends and how understanding how they apply to their lives, their lives, their business, what they're going to do. And so sparkpartners.com, uh, we do have training pro programs where we can help people do what I do, you know, because you want to think, you want to develop your own scenarios. You don't want to have to ask somebody else. And everyone can develop this skill. So think like an innovator is a new program that we've got out there. People can come in and they can take advantage of. And then, of course, you can just subscribe to the website. and We provide weekly blogs on current activities, uh, video blogs, talking about what's going on in the world and how it's going to affect people, the direction that uh, this is going to take. Uh, current events, the direction current events are taking. So uh, yeah, I look forward to it and ask me questions anytime. I love it because the only way that you can be a good forecaster is to have lots and lots of external data. The more external data, the better your accuracy of your forecast. So I love it when people come in and talk to me and give me opinions and give me their thoughts because they all help me get a better sense of where the world is headed. Fantastic. <laughs> Well, thank you so much. I know that there'll be a lot of Q Q and A, uh, and we'll we'll get that information captured and gathered, and continue to share that information as we go forward and assist people in understanding what the future holds and what you can know and understand to help your business grow and expand and flourish. So, Adam, thank you so much for your time and effort. Uh, Spark thought is here to support you. SparkCon 2020 is, is going to continue to, to uh, share amazing speakers this entire week. And also going in the future, we'll share it in the future as well. So thank you, Adam. I really appreciate your time and effort and uh, good luck in all your adventures. I've enjoyed participating and thank you for having me involved. I look forward to doing this again. Anytime. 2021. You bet. Thank you, everyone. We'll be right back with Q&A. And there we have it, another session and a lot of information to digest and share with your organization. Here at SparkCon 2020, we want to make sure that you have the opportunity to make those connections. And if you have any questions or any specific ideas that you want to share or transfer or communicate to Adam or with the team, 
just reach out to hi, H-I, at sparkthought.com. And I think that, you know, we're standing by, we're looking forward to opening up the dialogue and the communication and making sure that you have the resources and the tools you need to be successful. There's a lot of opportunity out there, even as challenging as it, as it is today in 2020. You know, we're, we're it's not all doom and gloom, and it's all going to be an evolution of the industry. It's going to be an evolution of ideas, progress, and technology. And some of the things that we're doing together and, and opening up that conversation, like Adam alluded to, is all of these ideas, when you get a lot of information flowing, it opens up new ideas. And Spark Thought and the ability to help and assist in, in the knowledge transfer and the knowledge management is what, what we wanted to bring to the table with SparkCon 2020. You know, this is uh, an opportunity that you can actually leverage for your organization. Use it for training, PSU, and uh, training credits or anything that you have that you need to fulfill for your organization and your team. You know, make sure that you're reaching out and communicating with the speakers and the thought leaders in the industry and understanding what it means to capture and collect this information and devise and develop your own programs. You know, we have a little bit of information. That doesn't mean it's the ultimate end result. Every, every organization is slightly different and unique. So that's why we brought a number of different platforms and, and speakers to the table. And Spark Thought has been uh, instrumental in bringing knowledge management and transfer. And, and so this collection is really important to, you know, kind of go through, understand and, and revisit on occasions. Uh, some of this information is technical in nature and also uh, allows you to think through some of the processes that you develop in your organization. Uh, from the environmental controls that David shared on Tuesday and, you know, some of the things that uh, are taking place on, uh, no, David was on Monday, apologize. So re retract, Tuesday was Batzel, Dr. Shaw talking about the geophysics and, and measuring the results and things. And I mean, there's so much information. Take this start digesting it, sharing and communicate and, you know, make some comments, reach out to the team. We just want to share this information and continue to pursue excellence. Now, I also want to, before I sign off here, I want to make sure that we uh, have uh, you join and sign up for Chad, Thoreau and Amon on compliance and knowledge management. Uh, this is tomorrow at 2 p.m., and it's really going to be an important session. Uh, knowledge management is so critical. And uh, also, Glenn is going to be at 1 p.m. to 2 p.m. Central Time, uh, HDD risk management. So horizontal drilling uh, is, is, is a big, uh, you know, it's a process that, most organizations have to deal with at some point in time. So these are important information, important subjects to talk about and share with you. So thank you again. If you want to reach out, hi at sparkthought.com. Hi at sparkthought.com. Amon and the team are going to be over there and uh, looking forward to your communication, conversation, and follow-up. So thank you so much for joining us on SparkCon 2020. And we look forward to seeing you in the next session tomorrow, starting at 1 p.m. Central. And one is it 1 p.m. Central? Yes, 1 p.m. Central to 2 p.m. Central time. Uh, Glenn DeBeston is going to be there to help you in your horizontal drilling efforts. So thank you again. I'm Russ Johns, SparkCon 2020. And you, enjoy the day. Take care.